This Docker tutorial is suitable for beginners to advanced levels. In this course, we are going to start from the basics of Docker fundamentals and gradually increase the level to intermediate and advanced levels. You can also avail a free Docker lab to practice Docker commands and concepts. Have a look at the agenda. This is what we will be learning throughout this course. We are going to begin with introduction and fundamentals of Docker. Once we get accustomed to it, we will move to learn Docker Compose. With the help of Docker Compose, we will be learning to run and manage complete application stack as containers. We are then going to level up and learn about Docker Swarm. It's going to help us to run our containers in a high availability mode. Basically, we are going to learn to deploy Docker containers clusters and learn to manage them. We are then going to discuss a bit about Kubernetes. Learn the key difference between Docker Swarm and Kubernetes. Towards the end of the course, we will discuss about some commonly asked interview questions and answers to prepare you for the interview. In the end, we will have a feedback round where you can share your feedback. You can also let us know what would you like to learn next. So, let's jump in to discuss about what is Docker? Well, before we jump into answering that, let's talk about what happens when you get an idea of a new business. Let's say you want to create an e-commerce website or probably a dating application like Tinder. Post the ideation phase, you would need to develop the application or hire someone to develop the application for you. And once the application is developed, you are going to market it. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, not really. Because before developing the application, you will be needing the infrastructure. What's the kind of infrastructure we will need depend on the architecture of the application deployment. Let's try to understand this with an example. We are going to assume the application which we want to build and deploy has following components. Web application. We are going to use Python to build this application. A database. How can we even think of running a dynamic application without a database? Let's say we also want to integrate the application with the payment system so our customers can make a payment while availing our services. We are assuming we will be using Fast API to, to connect to payment systems like Razor Pay or Stripe. We will also need an effective monitoring solution because, hey, we will need to ensure our application is running as intended. We want to be alerted whenever system doesn't work as expected. I am assuming you will use something like Prometheus and Grafana to monitor the infrastructure, database, and application performance. For alerting and notification, let's assume we will be using AWS SNS service. We can use Flask to connect to Amazon APIs or probably use Amazon SDK for Python. We would love to take backup of our entire system as well because we don't want to lose years and years of efforts we have put into our application development. You probably already know how hard it's going to be to manage infrastructure to deploy and run these applications or tools. Each item has its own dependencies, and you would not like to install everything on a single server. Trying to manage everything on a single server will have a lot of conflicts and issues, because one software or tool's dependencies will be conflicting with the other. So, we know the problem. What's the solution then? Of course, we can introduce virtualization. This is what IE architects have been recommending in the past. In this, we basically we have a server with a huge resources like CPU, memory, etc. We then create multiple virtual machines on top of this. For example, in our case, we will probably need at least six virtual machines to install and run six components, which we just discussed. Let's dig deep and try to understand the architecture of a typical virtual environment. At the bottom, we will have infrastructure, which of course is a large server with a huge system resources. We then install some sort of hypervisor software, which lets us create and manage virtual machines. We then create as many virtual machines as the underlying infrastructure will support. It might sound easy at first, but let me tell you it's not easy at all. Considering our example, we will need to create six virtual machines. Each virtual machines then will have to have operating system installed. We will also need to install all the required system packages or operating system level dependencies. So, in order to solve a problem, we basically end up into another problem of managing the virtualization. This is not something we wanted. Here, 
is various pro and cons of deploying our application stack on virtual machines. You can probably pause and read through it. Now, let us see how we can use Docker containers to install our applicant in stack easily and effectively. Here is how the architecture of Docker looks like. At the bottom layer, we have infrastructure, which is basically a server with huge resources. We then install operating system on top of this. Next, we will need to install Docker software on the operating system. That's it. We are now fully ready to run containers. We don't need to install and manage operating system on each of the containers. This is because Docker containers are going to share host operating system. So basically, we have already eliminated a big problem of having to manage multiple operating system and other dependencies. So what's a container? You can think of container as a box which has all the application packages required to run the service. For example, in case of our example of running web application which is built on Python, we basically will need Apache Tomcat to run our application. So we can have a box, also called container, which has Apache Tomcat already pre-installed and configured. We can run this container easy on any system which has Docker Engine installed. It can run on development server. Once the development is done, we can then use the same container to testing server or even to production server. And we are guaranteed that containers are going to run exactly the same way how it was running on the development server. Here is various pros and cons of Docker containers. You can probably pause and read through it for a minute. Enough of theory. Now, it is the time to get our hands dirty. Let's use IE Panther's free lab environment first, so we get a server where we can run and practice Docker. Please go to www.itpanther.com. Go to shop. Add Docker Virtual Lab to the cart. Apply the coupon code to get 100% discount. Click on Proceed to Checkout. Provide your email ID. Accept the terms and conditions and place the order. We are going to wait a couple of minutes to receive the server detail on our email box. You can see we have received the email with a link to connect to the server. We also have server credentials. Let's use these details to log in to the server. We have now successfully logged into the server. Our first step is to install Docker container. We can do that with the help of following command. Well, you don't need to memorize anything. You can always refer to this web article. I am going to give the link of this article as well. So let's go ahead and run the command to install install Docker. It's gonna take a few seconds to complete the Docker installation. You can see, we have Docker installed now. Docker services do not start automatically post installation, so we will need to run the following command to start Docker services. sudo systemctl will start Docker. This command doesn't return any output, so we will need to use another command to check the status of the Docker service. Let's do that by running sudo systemctl status Docker. As you can see, Docker services are showing in an active state. It means Docker services are running now. As you can see, to run Docker services, we are prefixing sudo. Let's add our current user to the Docker group, so we don't need to prefix sudo each time we use using Docker daemon client. We can easily do that by running the following commands. Great! You have now successfully installed Docker on a server. Let's move on and run our first Docker container. So, as I told you previously, you can think of Docker Container as a box which contains all the required dependencies to run a piece of software, package, or code. These boxes are called Docker Images. 
I am going to discuss about Docker images in detail later on. But first, we want to get started as soon as possible. Let's assume we are going to use Nginx web server to run our web application. So I can simply write Docker pull Nginx. Let's break down this. We run all the Docker commands using Docker client utility. That's why you see Docker prefix. We are using pull command to pull the image. You must be wondering where are these images being pulled from? Well, it's being pulled from something called image registry. In this case, it is hub.docker.com. You can see the image has been pulled successfully, and now this image is available on our server as well. We can always run docker images command to list all the images which are available on the server. We are now going to run a container based on this image. Let's run the following command for that. Let's break it down. We run a container with the command called run. We are using hyphen D, which means we want to run the container in a detached mode, basically running the container in the background. Next, we are using hyphen P and providing host and container port mapping. We know Nginx listens on port 80, so basically have Nginx services running inside a container and listening on port 80. Now, if someone wants to access our website, they will be typically using the host name or IP address of our website along with the port 80. So all the incoming requests on port 80 is being transferred to this container for processing. We are also providing a name to this container by specifying hyphen hyphen name parameter. We are calling our container my web server. In the end, we are providing the image name which should be used to run the container. In our case, image name is Nginx. We can now run docker ps comnad to see the list of all the running containers. If we want to stop a container, we can simply use docker stop command and provide the container ID or container name. You can see the container ID here. Let run the command to stop the container. Now let's run docker ps command again. You can see now we don't have any running image. We can start our container again by simply running docker start command. We can provide the container ID or container name of the container which we want to start. Let's try to see if Nginx is running properly. We can do that by trying to access our Nginx default web page. Let's copy the public IP address which we received in the email. Open a new tab and paste it there. Hit Enter. If everything goes well, you should be able to see a default web page of Nginx. Along with starting or stopping the container, you also have an option or removing the container altogether. We can do this by running docker rm command followed by the container ID or container name. Brilliant! So far you have learned very basics of docker container. Now, let's say we want to run our website on this Nginx container. So first, I am going to create a simple HTML web page. So let's first create a directory called my website. You can name this directory anything you would like. Inside this, let's create a web page called index.html. You can copy paste this default HTML there. Save it and exit from here. Now we are going to run the container again. But this time, we are going to run with some additional arguments. Since we want to use our web page, which is available on the host machine, we will have to mount this directory to Docker container. It is quite easy to do that with hyphen V argument. Here is how it would look like. Now, let's access this web page by specifying the public IP address of our server on the browser. 
Excellent. We are now running our website on a Docker container. So you saw how easy it is to run Docker containers. This is all because Docker containers are quite lightweight. We can run almost any type of service on containers. For example, if your application is using Redis for caching, you can simply run a container from Redis image. We can do that by running the following commands. Docker pull Redis. Now, let's see how to log into Docker containers. Let's say we want to write data to Redis database. So I am going to log into Redis container, which we have named as my Redis DB. We can use following command for this. Let's break down the command. Exec. This subcommand is used to execute a command in a running container, i.e. These are options used together. I stands for interactive, which means it allows you to interact with the container's standard input, STIN. T allocates a pseudo TTY or terminal. This option ensures that the command you run will have a proper terminal for input and output. We are now inside the Docker container. I can run Redis CLI commands now to insert the data to this database. Let's insert some data to this database by running Redis set command. Let's try to read the data by running Redis get command. Great, we are getting our data back. I am going to exit from the container by running exit command. That's all we have for this lesson. I hope you had a great time learning Docker so far. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel. I will appreciate if you can leave a comment as well giving feedback about the lesson. I will see you in the next lesson.